Uh, welcome everyone who is attending our series of webinars um, originated from the Villa University Center for Racial Justice. I'm Dr. Ismail, um, who was the um, organizer of the uh, panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, we have four great panelists on, on our session to discuss uh, a very significant verdict that happened earlier this week with regards to the George Floyd case, and also to have a critical discussion of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Uh, our moderator uh, this afternoon uh, is Mr. Hersey Jones, and I will turn it over to him to introduce yourself, to introduce himself, and then to get us started with the uh, panel discussion. Great, thank you, Ashmel, and hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, we've got a great panel, and Dr. Ashmel has already laid the foundation. So let me ask each of our panelists that's present at this point to take a few minutes to introduce yourselves to our audience. Uh, we'll start with you, Judge uh, Shepard. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Nicole Shepard. I am a civil district court judge in Arlene's Parish. I uh, am an adjunct professor at Delhi University, and uh, I've been uh, involved in our community for probably, I guess, maybe almost 30 years now, just to make sure that we provide access to justice to all people. Uh, and I really believe that this is uh, an important topic, obviously, and I think it's very timely. But I think that the, the things that happened this week are only just the beginning to make sure that change happens across the board and across all uh, sectors to save people's lives. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. And Mr. Dennis. Uh, I, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Dennis. I'm a director of the Southern Initiative Algebra Project <clears throat> from Northern Louisiana. I was born on the plantation outside of Shreveport. Uh, was raised in, from the age of 10 on to, in a place called Cedar Grove in Hollywood in Shreveport and, uh, and went to school, uh, did uh, undergraduate work at Dillon University. And uh, what I presently live in uh, South Carolina, uh, right outside of uh, Charleston, a place called Somerville, a sort of semi-retirement, but I'm still working with the algebra project and do a lot of work and still around home in New Orleans. And, uh, and I'm, it's, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. It's, it's uh, some great people. Good to see old friends. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. And uh, Attorney Hewitt. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Percy and, and everyone. Glad to join you. Uh, Damon Hewitt. I am currently the acting president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, an organization based in Washington, D.C., but that works with uh, organizers, activists, lawyers, and law firms all throughout the country. Uh, I uh, have been a civil rights attorney for pretty much my entire career, born and raised in New Orleans, uh, and uh, excited to always get a chance to do work, whether it's litigation, advocacy, or just being great conversation uh, that helps to generate ideas uh, in and for people in New Orleans, my hometown. Great, great, thank you. Is Sheriff Gusman with us? We're waiting on the sheriff to arrive. My name is uh, Percy Jones, Jr. I'm a 1983 Dillard graduate and a 1986 graduate of a Harvard Law School. Uh, I started out practicing tax law and ended up doing civil rights work and primarily filing in North Louisiana. About 90% of the police misconduct cases started in 1987 up through 2010. Uh, so this is an exciting subject for me and everyone on the panel, and I know our audience is ready to, uh, to hear from us. So let me just start out by asking, uh, I'll open a question and each panelist can pick in where they uh, desire. What did you think of the verdict this week? Well, I, I'll just start off by saying to me, it was, uh, it was a surprise. I did not expect the, uh, uh, all three counts uh, that would be found guilty. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the defense attorneys uh, zeroed in on the whole issue around intent. And I thought that was giving a way out for so at least coming up with a hung jury. So it was a surprise, but I thought it was good. It was a good beginning uh, for the country and for people to begin to look at the factors of what uh, needs to be done in terms of uh, police brutality. I came up in the time of, of, uh, uh, of, the, of when, when there were no police, you didn't see any black police officers. So there was no such thing as a black police officer. So I grew up to be very afraid of law enforcement, uh, especially in Northern Louisiana, in Shreveport, Louisiana. 
uh, and I've had my run-ins with the uh, with the police department and justice department around the country. Is I've been arrested 33 times and spent times in in many jails. Uh, so I understand about police brutality. I've been beaten by police more than once and more than twice, more than three times. So I thought it was a step forward. And uh, now the question is, where do we go from there? Yeah. I thought that the jury, um, I thought that they did a great job with paying attention and being engaged um, in the cases, and I can tell you that from, from a judge's standpoint, when we have jury trials, we want our jurors to pay attention. We want our jurors to follow uh, the instructions that the court uh, is providing to them. And we want our jurors to be able to pay attention to the evidence, pay attention to the witnesses, and just be attentive throughout the entire process. And so I thought that that was really, really important. Uh, some people had the opportunity to actually uh, watch the entire trial uh, from their homes or from their offices or whatever, wherever they were. Uh, and that was good. But for some people, they didn't have an opportunity to actually watch the trial in its entirety. And so for people who saw this unedited video uh, of this approximate nine minutes, um, paying attention to the posture of the police officer, um, but then also seeing, you know, weight bared on this this man, you know, this human being, and you see the struggle and you see uh, the life just kind of disappear right in front of your eyes and it's all there and it's not edited. So uh, for people who actually saw that video, it was very concerning. So I think a verdict, a verdict of not guilty would have been a real, real traumatic blow for so many people across the country because it's like, okay, well, you saw it. Um, and maybe not seeing all the evidence presented, but that, that piece of evidence I thought was just critical. Uh, and then when you get to the other factors, because as you know, you know, you can have a criminal charge, but all the elements have to be met. So obviously it's the prosecution's job to, to place that burden and, and that burden has to be met saying beyond a reasonable doubt. And so for, from a juror standpoint, beyond a reasonable doubt means that you shouldn't have any doubt at all. You shouldn't have if you think maybe he did it or maybe it was you know, actual homicide, if it's maybes, then that tells you that you may have doubt. So I think that the, the prosecution obviously did a good job presenting the case, presenting the information, and then the testimony of the witnesses uh, who were there, who actually saw it. I thought that was all critical um, in putting the case together that the jurors uh, was able to view and see and say, hey, this homicide really did, did happen and somebody has to be responsible uh, for the actions that caused the death of Mr. George Floyd. So I thought it was a very timely verdict and uh, accurate verdict. And I hope um, that people was able to see that justice um, was, was served in this particular matter by this guilty verdict, but we still have a long way to go. Attorney here, you know this was a rarity, am I correct? It is a rarity, uh, Brother Jones, you know, to have a police officer charged, have a police officer uh, charged in the killing of a, of a black person, a black man, have a police officer convicted, not just on manslaughter, but on murder, two different degrees of murder. That is, uh, you'd want to almost say it's darn near historic, it, but it, it is a rarity. Uh, because juries are not inclined to convict in many instances. Uh, prosecutors are not inclined to bring charges and uh, especially not bring the higher charges. They focus on the, the lesser charges, in this case, lesser included charges. So it, it, is, it is a rarity. And I think, you know, just in terms of my own reaction, I was a bit, a little bit surprised because I, I was preparing myself mentally for a mixed uh, verdict, right? Uh, for conviction on the manslaughter and maybe the lower murder charge. Uh, a little bit surprised about all three, but the evidence certainly is there. It's plain to see. Um, and I, I think one of the beauty of the prosecution strategy here was that it let the community tell its own story about the pain and the anguish. It wasn't just about the state. Uh, at the same time, this was one case in, in one city, uh, in one person's life. Uh, that, that, that was lost. And there's so many cases in which there were not only failed prosecutions, but declinations of prosecution uh, in the first place, that there was no prosecution at all. Uh, one of our um, 
my executive team members in my office described it as a sense of relief, but relief of the sort where you've been pelted by rocks day in, day out, repeatedly all the time, and then one of them missed. And so I think we have to take those perspectives into account as well when we think about not that this moment means nothing, um, but it's also not the case that this moment means everything. I think it is what we make of it and how we leverage it. Uh, and I think what there is to leverage is not legal precedent per se, but certainly a sense of momentum. It is much easier in some ways to advocate uh, for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which we'll be talking about today, with a sense of momentum, instead of only from a really familiar sense of outrage and indignation. And so I think if we can make that pivot collectively uh, from pure critique to now leadership uh, and what the forward-looking vision is, I think that uh, it, it uh, kind of bodes well for all of us. You know, and I do want to get to the, the reason we're here, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, but I want to ask one more question. What do you think would have happened if that video had not been there? Mm. Not guilty. <clears throat> I think that that's a very important factor there is, is that the uh, that this video is taken. And also remember, it was not taken by uh, the police cam. That's correct. This was taken by an, a citizen. In fact, is it was 13 year old young lady? I think that's right. Okay. Oh, who took this video is had not had that, that for that video you I don't think you would have got beyond a, a hung jury, you know, and even with that much uh, there is you still had people, a lot of black people had doubts whether or not they found guilty anyway. They'd be hungry, including myself. All right, <laughs> deal with that fact. But I think that's a very important factor for us to understand about this case is is the first time that we've seen a person, a black person actually dying, you know, as a result of the uh, uh, force of a police officer, the hands of police officer. And I'm talking about dying slowly. It's not like being shot. I mean, seeing this actual nine minutes of life being stuffed right now. And we witnessed that and people witnessed it. So that was the first time that that's ever happened. Gil Scott Heron said that the revolution would not be televised. He might be wrong because it's beginning to make a big change here. I think it's very important is that is that little tool of the phone and the camera there is that put a lot of power in the hands of the local community in terms of how to combat this kind of racism. Uh, Judge Shepard, let me mention something and get your reaction to it. The initial police press release did not mention the officer Shelby to having his knee on George Floyd's neck and did not, it made it appear that he had a medical condition that he died from. Does that disturb you? It is because, you know, uh, credibility is really, really important. And so when people come to court, uh, we expect lawyers uh, to maintain their oath uh, when police officers or uh, on the job and in court, we expect them to maintain their oath, but credibility is so important. And so because the statements initially were very um, learned to, obviously we learned that that wasn't correct. Um, I think I was, I think it was very, very problematic because I think that the law enforcement agency lost all credibility um, from the very beginning. So, but for this video, uh, we would have a very different outcome. It would just look like, you know, he had these medical conditions and it would have been a case that probably would not have, you know, made the national news uh, to the extent that it did. And people would have gotten away with, uh, with a homicide. And we've seen that happen over and over and over and over again uh, for decades. And so it just would have been another one of those cases. So I think the credibility uh, is an issue. It is very, very problematic. And I think that this video um, just change the trajectory uh, of the case, the case, of course, and then where our country is heading. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, let's get to why we're here, the George Floyd Justice and Police of the Act of 2020. Uh, Attorney Hewitt, you want to tell us about that? Sure. Well, this legislation is something I would say is, is a long time coming. Um, 
it is not a panacea uh, for everything that ails us. And there certainly will be debate about the various provisions, but there are some potentially, potentially uh, game-changing components. And I say game-changing, not that in a vacuum that they change everything on their own, but they're game-changing because they can be catalysts for what's really needed here, which is significant culture shift, transformation uh, in policing and in, in terms of how police interact uh, with community. And I think some of these provisions, and I'll, I'll say actually have support amongst many in law enforcement. I think there's certainly uh, some, not as vocal as you might like to see, but there are many who are uh, in favor of the basic accountability and transparency provisions. There's two that I find significantly uh, important. There, there's several and others may talk about them, but one, two of them are the one-two punch of, of potential criminal and civil liability. On the civil side, there's a judge-made doctrine of qualified immunity, which essentially shields individual officers from civil lawsuits, from having to pay damages uh, in many circumstances. Uh, there's a legal standard which we could go into, but essentially it, it shields officers, especially if they're said to be acting within policy uh, for, their, for their police departments. If a reasonable person wouldn't have, reasonable officer wouldn't have thought they were violating or didn't know they were violating someone's constitutional rights. Um, and I think it, 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 it's a kind of doctrine that is an invitation to create gray area when there should be really a bright line distinction between what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that frankly allows officers to act uh, with impunity, meaning that you know, they know there's not gonna be significant consequences on the civil side. And then on the criminal side, we know, uh, we've talked a bit about you know, actual prosecutions or de declinations of prosecution uh, by local district attorneys or even state attorneys general. But where you see prosecutions even less frequently is at the federal level. You hear about these incidents and you saw this happen uh, with, the, with the cops who beat Rodney King in the early 1990s. Uh, they were prosecuted at the state level, but they were acquitted. And there was, of course, outrage and the up uprising and the, the, the reaction that, 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 that we all saw on television. And some people actually lived through it. Uh, but what you did see after that was federal prosecutors come in thereafter for at least some of those officers. Now, there's a really, really high bar for federal charges to be brought. Um, and what the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act would do is it would actually lower that bar and make it more likely that charges are brought. Now, for the civil and criminal sanctions, for those who oppose them, I want you to keep this in mind, or those who are concerned about them at least. This doesn't mean that every police officer and every police department is going to get sued and be indicted. That is not what it means. It's still gonna be in, in a fairly limited set of cases, but it will reach some important cases. When you think about some of the most egregious incidents that we've heard of and seen uh, as a country, when you think about the killing, uh, the shooting of Tamir Rice, a 12 year old uh, who was carrying a toy. When you think about Sean Bell in New York City who was killed the night before his wedding. These are cases in which federal prosecutors said, we can't bring charges because we can't meet the legal standard and the burden. Even though everybody who uh, saw the aftermath of the incident, so I actually saw the incident in the case of Tamara Rice on video, everybody knows it's wrong. Everybody in any officer worth their assault would say, gosh, that's not the right thing to do, right? But the feds could not bring charges in those cases. So lowering that standard uh, for criminal liability is very important. When you have the potential for civil and criminal liability, I believe it makes it easier for police officers, it makes it easier for, for them to say, you know what, I'm going to, to, to pause a beat before I act. And look, these are not circumstances in which officers' safety have been at issue. Uh, these are circumstances when office, some of the officers actually put themselves in situations without what they're trying to do, which is conceal and cover, right? To protect themselves. But you always repeatedly hear, well, my life was in danger. And it's now become kind of a cliche. Policing is a dangerous job. There's no doubt about that. But the fact that so many officers just say, well, my life was in danger and use that as an excuse, that kind of wipes away potential civil and criminal liability. And that's exactly what the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is designed to, is designed to disrupt. And there's other components which others may want to discuss and I can as well, if you'd like uh, later on. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Hewitt. Is uh, Jeff, is uh, Sheriff Gessman on the line with us? I am here. Yeah, welcome, Sheriff Gessman. You're just in time. Thank you, uh, sir. We have just started our discussion on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. And as a law enforcement person, we're raring to hear your comments. Well, first, you know, I think that the verdict was correct. Uh, we, as a country, cannot tolerate things like that. Uh, secondly, I think that we have to now go about the next process, which is, you know, we have to train our police officers better. Uh, we have to uh, demilitarize the police in their response, engage with the community on, on not just when <clears throat> there's a problem, but engage with the community when there are good things to happen. And police officers ought to be as commonplace as the, uh, I started to say the mailman, but, you know, as commonplace as... Uh, the playground or anything, and not just show up when there's a problem. And, you know, I think that's the, the real challenge that we have to change our police force uh, so that they're not coming in uh, like gangbusters to clear something up, but they're coming in as a friend, they're coming in as a co-participant, uh, they're coming in as people that share in this together. You know, there was a big move, uh, at some time in, in the past when you wanted to make sure that all your police officers lived in the community. And part of the reason why they did that and people wanted to do that is because they wanted those police officers, they have ownership and they didn't want them to live in the suburbs and they just come into the community and act like they were uh, you know, coming in to clean up the town and then they could leave. So maybe those are some things that we have to get back to you know, having them come back and live in the community. Now, past that, uh, just as a citizen and, and as a, a black man, you know, I think we can't stop uh, at just, you know, protesting about verdicts and about lost lives. You know, we have to be about building our community and seeing the injustice in having substandard streets or the in injustice in having substandard uh, city services. Uh, making sure that we have access to uh, decent grocery stores, uh, that we're not on these uh, food deserts. Uh, so there's a whole lot of work we got to do, including just voting every day, every yeah. every weekend. Uh, is the law enforcement community supporting the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act? I think it is because, look, everybody wants to be better. And it's hard to be against, uh, you know, one thing I left out was transparency. It's hard to be against transparency if you're, you know, a good law enforcement officer. Uh, I think you're going to have some law enforcement officers, just like you have some law enforcement officers who are, who are, are not good, who are going to be against it. But uh, by and large, I think you're going to see support for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you about qualified immunity. Will that make it harder for you to hire police officers if that's amended as is projected to be done or dismissed in the uh, George Floyd Police Act? Look, you know, those are, those are issues that get very technical. Um, the, you know, immunity uh, for something that you have done that is wrong uh, should not exist. <clears throat> And qualified immunity, um, you know, I, I know you're saying you're in the course and scope of your duties, uh, but that's, that's a, it gets into a fine line. And uh, we have to draw that line every day. Okay, Judge Shepard, your thoughts? <clears throat> well, I think holding people accountable is just vitally important. I mean, we all have our responsibilities, but I think accountability is, is really important. Um, just, you know, know that we know that uh, qualified immunity basically is, is just judgment law. And when you when you kind of think about the protection, so we're saying that we're going to protect people, but I don't think that we should protect people who have done wrong and committed crimes. So I think it's problematic because then on one end, you hear people say, well, nobody is above the law. 
well, if we don't address the issues as it relates to qualified immunity, then in essence, we are saying indirectly that a certain group of people who have been tasked with certain duties are, are yet above the law and they can escape prosecution uh, or civil liability for wrongdoing. And so I do think that, um, I do think that we have to address it, but it has to be ongoing. But then our, our communities, like, like, you know, having the community police and then having our police officers there and getting to know who the community members are, but then also allowing the community members to know them and build relationships, because I think that we can solve more problems and address uh, issues in our, in our, in our, on our streets if we have better relationships between the community and law enforcement. But trust is a big thing and relationships, are, relationships matter. And so I think we have to uh, get in those trenches and make sure that we're establishing uh, that foundation so that when, uh, if there is misconduct, then you have members from the, from the community who can go in and contact the PIB or independent police monitors if they have those things in place and then share the information and, and nip the problem in the bud. And I think if the community can feel comfortable coming in and making a report and knowing that something will happen and that person will be held accountable, then I, I think it kind of puts people in a better position to trust our law enforcement community. Mr. Dennis, are you still? Mr. Jones? Yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. I heard someone call my name. Yeah, I was. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt Mr. Dennis. Uh, I just want to add, though, to what Judge Shepard said, is that it's, you know, body-worn cameras uh, are also very important. And we should not have had to rely on uh, a young teenager to video this encounter. Uh, had there been a body-worn camera, more transparency, uh, that would have been a part of the report. Uh, and that would have made that officer act better, I hope. Okay, uh, Mr. Dennis. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, uh, Chef Gusman. Uh, I wanted to say hi to you, but I work very closely with your brother, Patrick. Uh, oh, glad to hear that. Uh, in fact, we're on the phone together about two or three times a week. But at any rate, is along this, uh, uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a big skeptic here because uh, absolutely correct, this body camera been on, on if. Uh, if that police officer is wearing a body cam, camera, I think that uh, 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 Mr. Floyd would be alive today because he wouldn't have done what he did because he knew it was on film, you know? So that would have been a big difference there, I think. So I think that is important. But I'm also very skeptical about the whole piece here. I mean, I think it's good, we need it. Uh, we need to deal with it. But another thing that uh, Mr. Gusman said earlier, it has to do with, you know, I'll register to vote and be more politically active. And I'm gonna tell you why. This reminds me of uh, 1870, 1871 Civil Rights Act, where you had in there the Ku Klux Klan Act. And in the Ku Klux Klan Act, it did a lot of what you have here. I mean, uh, the president had the right to, uh, to call martial law and whatever, which he did and everything else to, 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 to disarm the, the Klan and to protect black people at that time. But it didn't take long. I mean, that was 1870, 1872. A few years later, you know, uh, the Supreme Court overturned this, all right? The whole uh, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1870, 71, but especially the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act, which is quite similar to the uh, George Floyd Act. And so what I'm getting at here is, is that we have to be very careful here is because everything in here can be challenged by the courts and which will be at some point is gonna be uh, uh, and go before the Supreme Court. So the stacking of that Supreme Court as it is now is extremely important. And what's happening at the local elections and local judges and what we have here. So we have to be more uh, very cognizant about this, the, the, these acts, whatever it is, how do you protect it or keep it in places, or put more things in place and, and with strength in it and they stay there, you know, uh, because it didn't take but 11 years uh, for the 1870-71 but Civil Rights Act to be overturned primarily by the Supreme Court of the United States. So what I'm saying is we need to really talk about uh, not do what we did in 1964 in the Civil Rights Act and 1965 Voting Rights Act is, we sort of went to sleep. So we came up with uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and we thought it, we integrated. Black people integrated, white people did not integrate. 
So the result of it, what, what happened to our black communities and what we call the village to raise a child, they're not there anymore. New Orleans, a good example. You know, what they put in the place what you call the uh, urban renewal, all right? Expressway right straight down Claiborne, uh, Claiborne Avenue, which a, a, a majority of the black business existed in. You know, all that's gone and everything else is. And that, not only in New Orleans, but every place, in, an important place, a large city in the United States. And that was intentional, all right? To destroy the power base of the black community. So we have to be very, when these things come, how do you protect it? How do you struggle or put a foundation around it and, and organizing and, and, and you know, is when you talk about the police officers, this whole piece and their relation to community, it's extremely important. Who is gonna set up the meetings and the workshops and the discussion groups? You know, what, ch what churches be able, we can get involved in? How do we get the police officers to, to be able and be willing to sit down with the community people and with the young people in those communities and have honest conversations and talk about change and what needs to be put in place to support that type of change? So the work is that we got a lot of work to do is, but a lot of it has, depends on us uh, to really get out there and roll up our sleeves as, uh, and, uh, and, and put this whole thing together is because without that, you can't depend upon the enemy to solve this problem. All right, they have to force them to solve the problem. That's going to our hands to make that happen, both in the courts and the, and the, and the law enforcement, in the churches and the schools, and the community as a whole. Mr. Dennis, you raise a very important point. Let me point something out. The qualified immunity doctrine, which was just created, itself was pulling back from the Ku Klux Klan Act which exposed all officials to uh, liability for damages and violating constitutional rights. But I don't know if you know it or not, but the doctrine was created as a result of the Freedom Riders uh, in Mississippi. And, and it was one of these things that appeared to be once Blacks were getting the right to vote and the right to serve on juries and the right to have some take some protection from the police, this doctrine comes along to sort of take it away. And so the George Floyd Act is, is removing that doctrine and, and, and would appear to make police more uh, uh, liable, uh, easier to hold them liable. But you're suggesting that it may not work. Yeah, I think it takes, it's going to take more because the fact is they've already put in place of, of something to be able to counter that. All right, when you say taking it back and move it back is. And so uh, that, and that goes to the Supreme Court of the United States, how that is, how the laws are interpreted, you know, when you talk about reckless, when you talk about, you know, intentional, and those particular words that carry a lot. And I mean, it's all of the open for interpretation, what it means is and has been. So I'm saying is, is that we have to take into uh, consideration about this how uh, you teach the community is, but we have to begin to raise those questions. You know, I mean, getting uh, the, that act through is not enough because the fact is even if you get it through is it gets, it's right down the road, okay, is the barrier, you know, and we have to be un understand that is. And so what are we gonna be doing in the meantime to put something in place to make sure it doesn't happen as it did in, 18, in 1800s? Yeah. Now, now, let me toss out a, a scenario. Uh, thank God we don't have to face it. Um, the city settled the civil suit and qualified immunity applies in a civil suit. So let me ask you, would George Floyd have been entitled uh, to qualified immunity if he had been sued civilly? You're talking about Officer Chauvin? Chauvin. Oh, Chauvin, you're right. Yeah, Chauvin. Well, look, I, I think there's a... Uh, Certainly, there's a lot of indicators, not just the fact of his criminal conviction, but the fact that everything he did was outside of policy. Uh, it's going to be, it will be very difficult for him to argue that he acted in good faith, right? But it is an affirmative defense that he would, he would lift up. Any good, you know, civil uh, defense lawyer will lift it up. And so I'd like to think that a trial court and any court of appeals all the way up to a state or U.S. Supreme Court would find that qualified immunity wouldn't attach in that instance, but he's entitled to raise it essentially as an affirmative defense in the first instance. And Attorney Hewitt, the reason I raised that issue is because the 
the doctrine has a clearly established law requirement. And when we practice, when I practice, we call that the first one free. Mm. If no judge had ruled it illegal, then the officer, whether it was a chokehold or a hog, right. would be able to hide under the immunity. Right. That's right. And, and look, I think that the reason why I would be hopeful that it wouldn't attach in, in, in that instance, and we may actually soon see if, if the state decides to, the family decides to file suit, I'm not sure if they have, uh, is this. So he was on the man's neck for, we thought it was eight minutes and 45 seconds was nine and a half minutes, right? And so you had all the people in community saying, you're killing him, stop. Right. And so it, th there could be some indicators that, look, it was just this was beyond the pale. But had there been a ruling that this particular uh, te technique was unconstitutional or that it was banned, I don't believe so. So I think it could be somewhat of a contested matter in court, although I would be hopeful if I were filing a suit. My orientation is as a as a, as a civil lawyer, uh, plaintiff side lawyer, that, that it wouldn't attach. But here's the thing. Even if qualified immunity wouldn't attach in the case of that particular officer, this is one of the most egregious sets of circumstances that you could ever find. Like to be killed a slow murder in broad daylight uh, with, with community standing by being traumatized uh, at, at the time. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I think that there's, again, there's a good argument that it wouldn't attach here, qualified immunity, uh, but it's because of the egre very egregiousness of the circumstances. But you think about all the things uh, where the, all the potential civil or actual civil suits, you jump out of a car, you see a boy, it turns out to be a toy gun, you get, ask no questions, shoot first, ask questions later. Um, you are uh, trying to, uh, in a traffic stop, an officer in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, outside Minneapolis, uh, is find someone who has a warrant, Dante Wright. Um, oh, taser, taser, taser. I thought I was going to shoot my gun. Uh, I thought I was going to shoot my taser. I shot my gun instead. Same thing that happened with, with Oscar Grant. Uh, Sean Bell, oh, he, the car lurched forward, so we're going to light up the car, uh, you know, with, with many, many bullets. So you, none of these circumstances, uh, in, in my view, uh, should, should, you know, be shielded uh, from liability. But this will be a contested space in the courts. And, you know, and for me, this is the reason why I think just wiping away the whole doctrine makes it actually easier for everyone because you don't have to, there's no conjecture. And the truth of the matter is in many jurisdictions, police officers, you know, uh, are indemnified by the jurisdictions anyway. It's not even as if it's going into their pockets, but what's difficult is that the families don't get any kind of reasonable payout unless there's a settlement unless the city decides to settle. Uh, and that and that, is, that in of itself, money doesn't bring your loved one back, uh, but there should be some recompense when these incidents happen. Thank you, thank you. Judge Shepard, one of the items people find most repulsive about qualified immunity is that the judge determines it, not the jury. Is that correct? You usually see the judge on that, yes, sir. And so it basically, the judge, is rather than the community or the jury making a determination as to whether uh, this officer is entitled to it, it's the judge that's doing that. And that right. kind of run counter to the fact that the factual determinations are made by the jury. Well, well, keep in mind with this, you know, so Mr. Dennis said earlier about voting. And so when you have people that are elected and they have powers to elect judges. Um, and then you have people who are elected to who will ultimately appoint judges, then we need to pay attention to people's history and their track record and things that they've done. And then especially, I, I believe things that they've done in the community and their interaction with the community. So if you go back to the Jamison case and you look at Judge Carlton Reeves's opinion, and I think for all cases that are, are coming up as it relates to qualified immunity, uh, he followed the, he followed the law that was set up before his time. So he looked at the precedents and, and made his ruling based on uh, what was before him and the law that was as is. However, he did give a very scathing opinion on this black man who stopped and he's detained for you know 110 minutes and 
without any probable cause. And, um, and, and so he talks about that. And he talked about, you know, that he did walk away with his life where so many others did not. So it is before the judge, but it's also important for the people to elect judges who, um, who will mind serving uh, fair and, and being fair and being prepared and following the law. But then also for, you know, people like presidents who are going to appoint federal judges, making sure that you have a, a president who is going to represent all the people in the country and not just certain sectors of the, comp of the country. Because when you appoint certain judges and they bring in their own different ideologies, then we get different results. And you have a lot of people, unfortunately, who don't think that qualified immunity is a problem, who don't think that people, um, people's actions are um, illegal or, or, or problematic. Keep in mind that we did get a, a verdict that said guilty, but you have a lot of people who don't believe after seeing the video for nine minutes that uh, it was wrong. So making sure that we have people in place who will serve all people of all races, all uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, and to make sure that they understand and are willing to follow the law, even when it's not popular, and then make, make sure that the judiciary um, remains uh, independent and, and being able to render decisions based on the law and not um, political theories or what's popular in the country at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, uh, Sheriff Gusman. The act also lowers the criminal intent standard in federal prosecution from willful to knowing or reckless. So it makes it easier to prosecute a police officer. Would that cause a problem for you in hiring? Well, I think we need to always look at trying to pay people better so we can hire better. Um, but you know, you say easier. I don't know if that's really the, the right way I would put it. I would say that it, it it perhaps lowers the threshold of proof. Uh, and in a sense, that makes it easier. But, you know, there still has to be that clear, convincing evidence that, you know, this was done uh, recklessly, what a reasonable person would not do. Uh, so, you know, it gets into that reasonable, reasonableness standard. And that's what's important for us to always keep in mind that we're not trying to make anything easier. We're trying to keep on this reasonable standard. Uh, and is it reasonable, for example, in the, in the George Floyd case, to hold your uh, knee on someone's neck and throat and think that there won't be any consequences? You know, and that's clearly unreasonable. Any other comments? I wanted to say something else. Uh, Mr. Sure, go ahead, Sierra. Add on to what Mr. Dennis was saying. Now, I think he really put it in perspective, part of what I was trying to say myself that, you know, after the 1964 civil rights, maybe we went like, whew, glad, you know, that's behind us. And we can't say the same thing here, you know, even if we get the, the George Floyd Act passed, you know, because we've now had the, the guilty verdicts, we can't say, wow, glad it's over. It's not over, it's only beginning. You know, this is the beginning of it. We have to stay on it. And maybe in 64, they got a little bit lax in thinking that, oh, we're integrated, we're all good, we can go wherever we want. That was only the thing because, you know, they're, they're constantly trying to find ways to, to uh, trip us up again or to make another law. That's what's happening right now in Georgia. You know, so in Georgia, we had a great um, vote turnout uh, you know, it didn't go Trump's way. And you know what they're doing now? Now they're coming up with some new laws, some new uh, methods, some new hurdles for us to overcome so that we, we can do something just as simple as exercise the right to vote. And uh, Sheriff, yeah, you're right. And, 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 I mean, you're right. It's totally problematic. And then I just kind of want to make clear too, we do have some laws that are not right. And, and so we do want people to follow the law, but we do need to address the laws that are not uh, proper, the ones that are outdated, um, the ones that are discriminatory on its face. And so, but it also goes back to, I think of having people who will come up and challenge those laws. Uh, and then just like we have lobbyists that are lobbying for all kinds of things, we do need to have people in place that are going to do that. We have to empower our 
uh, young people, but it can't just start in, you know, we can't say it just starts with uh, college students and, and Mr. Joe Gibbons is um, always working with our college students to make sure that they are, you know, involved and engaged, but, you know, have a conversation with the kindergartner so the kindergartner knows what it looks like and what to expect. Uh, my mom took me to vote when I was a child. I take my children to vote. Uh, and then, you know, my daughter and Sheriff, you know my daughter, and, and we debate on who I'm a vote for, <laughs> and it's my vote. You know, she's only 12, but we debate on who, you know, um, who we're going to vote for, you know. Uh, so just being engaged and, you know, yes, they should watch children's stories and, and kids programming, but they also need to be engaged in a conversation of what the pol political climate looks like so they're prepared and not blindsided. But but we have to do, and I'm saying specifically our, our communities, we have to be engaged and make sure that we are bringing people to the table. And for the ones who can't sit at the table, they need to be in the room where the decisions are being made and we're failing at that. Yeah, I want to uh, uh, add to this just very briefly as I think these, uh, these uh, two last statements are fantastic, great on point because you, how do you control this pieces? I mean, we need to we need to educate the community. So we need more of these type discussions, but we need to get the other people to the table who can participate in those discussions. So what would happen if in New Orleans is we begin to have a campaign going from church to church, place to places, where about lawyers and judges and police officers, sheriff's department can come and sit down with parishioners and other people to have these discussions to get their input. But it, uh, the, beyond that though, to educate them so they understand what this act is all about. The, the, uh, the pluses and the, and the minuses of it and what we can do as a community, what, they, what we have to do as a community to protect this and make it something that is real to protect our children. I was, I was and given the importance of this thing and, and the political action here is, I'm uh, just reading on the chat room, uh, Damon, and uh, thank you, Damon, for putting this up here. Uh, it was a case I had forgotten about, the city of Fresno, Jessup. In that case here, when you talk about qualified immunity, uh, the way the courts ruled uh, in that case was that these are some police officers who were, were accused of, of stealing, all right, taking money, all right, $200,000 and stuff. Is. And so they were protected under qualified immunity, you know, pieces, you know, that's ridiculous. But that's because who's elected to be the, uh, the judge and people there to enforce or to, to, to interpret the laws as, as we did. So we have to become much more cognizant, like what happened in 1964, 65, and a lot of times is, you know, what do we do as a people to protect our communities? Because we can't just depend upon what action, uh, actions takes place or take, has, been taken, has taken place at that particular moment, because they, they, they always think ahead. There are these documentaries out here, as I remember that, and, and, uh, after uh, talked about the 1964 and 65, is you look at the, the racist people then, you know, Perez and you had uh, uh, Wallace and all they all said the same thing in, in meetings and stuff. They got the Civil Rights Act, but we coming back, we're getting back. And in 1968, in 64 and 68 is when this really started in a big time way. I mean, the Republican Party uh, was, the, uh, that, uh, was, the, was the black man's party. It was the Free Lincoln Party. And so, and, and so that switched over, black people began to move to the Democratic Party, especially the South, because that was the only party in the sense that that was in existence. So it was going to take over the party to get the right to vote and stuff like that. We moved to the Democratic Party. 1960 is the last time that a majority of white males were part of the Democratic Party. They moved back to the uh, moved to the Republican Party and said, now this is the white man's party. All right. And so what you have now is there is this racist party that switch, which was a Democratic Party up to 1960. All right, 61. You know, I mean, Martin Luther King was a, a, a Democrat. His daddy was a, was a Republican. Yeah. And so this whole piece becomes very important in terms of the history. So our community needs to understand that history. We need a better understanding of history and how to begin to work around using that history to inform us of what we have to do in the, in the future to be able to put, the, uh, uh, put together a kind of a program to address these issues. The um, Sheriff Gusman, the act also outlaws no knock warrants. And tell us exactly what is a no knock warrant. So uh, basically a no knock warrant, no knock warrant allows someone, allows a police officer 
not to announce himself before entering uh, by force a dwelling. So there's no knock on the door. There's there's no identification. You know, police uh, were coming in, and you know the, the idea behind it, you know, of, of course, is that you don't you want to get the surprise, uh, the surprise element, uh, but that has to be weighed against uh, the element which is you know sacrosanct in in our constitution that a man's man's home is his castle and the right to privacy, the Fourth Amendment. So uh, I'm really not a favor of no knock warrant. You know, I'd rather uh, wait outside, let them come in, you know, uh, and that you should only use that in the most extreme circumstances and not grant that for uh, uh, anything like a narcotics bust or, or anything like that. And, and look, we've seen what's happened with no knock warrants. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, and, and I don't know enough about the research to know that if it's no knock warrants or, or more readily granted uh, when it's an African American's home versus uh, Caucasian home, but uh, I'd be willing to see if, if there is any correlation there. But no knock warrants, uh, the risk of something going wrong uh, does not outweigh, um, you know, it, it, that's outweighed by the, you can just wait. I want to, you know, I just want to just say, Cheryl Gusman, I want to thank you just for your clarity on, on these points. I, I think that should not uh, go unsaid um, because it takes a lot for someone uh, who is a leader in law enforcement to say what you say. But I think your views are actually more mainstream than a lot of people may appreciate, but not everyone has the, the conviction and courage to come out and say it. Uh, so I just want to express that appreciation for you. Uh, also, I, I'd say on a no-knock warrant piece, one nuance of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is that it bans no-knock warrants for federal officers. As far as local and state, however, it's all about a contingency on whether you receive the federal COPS program grant, community-oriented policing program grants. So that's the that's kind of the what some call coercion, right? That, that the power of the purse that the feds have. So it wouldn't automatically stop all the no-knock warrants. So we still have to take the kind of perspectives that Sheriff Gusman lifted up uh, to inform local policy because of the bill wouldn't automatically ban no-knock warrants throughout the country. And then that, that's a good point. And then back to what um, Mr. Dennis is saying, political engagement is going to be very important. Um, years ago, I was involved with a no-knock warrant in uh, Alexandria, Louisiana. It, uh, the execution of it resulted in two Alexandria police officers being killed. Three more were injured, and the um, suspected drug dealer himself was killed. Now, this particular uh, law out, uh, bans it in federal and drug cases, particularly, is what they're talking about. And when we did the deposition of one of the officers, he was white, who executed the warrant, the head guy said they didn't think they had probable cause to even do the raid. The other officer said, and I'm gonna ask the same question of uh, Sheriff Gusman. I asked him if he was sitting in his house with his family and his gun was handy and someone kicked his door in, would he shoot first or would he ask questions? Uh, he said, I would have done the same thing the victim did. Sheriff Gusman, would you have done the same thing? Well, look, it goes back to the Fourth Amendment, uh, man's home is his castle. And, you know, you could add some other factors in there. What if it was dark? What if it was at night? You're doggone right I would. You know, I'm there to defend my family. I'm there to protect my family. And, you know, if someone comes in, there shouldn't be any presumption that, they're coming in for something good. They're probably coming in for something bad and nefarious. And uh, that's why, you know, I'm against it. I think we can wait. You know, if it's a drug bust that, that they're trying to do, wait. Catch them on the way out. You know, don't invade someone's home where their children could be there. And, and look, we've had these cases here in New Orleans where, um, you know, the police have rushed in and, you know, killed, killed a person. Um, you know, when they were at the top of the steps, you know, it, it doesn't end up good. And as you pointed out, it doesn't end up good for the police lots of times. 
because they could lose their own lives and it doesn't end up good for uh, the homeowner or the, or the occupant. So the best thing to do is not to do them. Uh, but look, going back to this thing about elections, you're right, it doesn't apply locally unless they get federal cops money, but we, we better start putting in the right people, uh, electing the right people. Under Trump, there were 234 Article Three judges appointed. 234. You know, you thought he was just saying all kind of crazy stuff about injecting himself with disinfectant. But in the meantime, they were in the background appointing judges that are going to be there for life on the Supreme Court, on the federal bench, on the appeals court bench. That's what we do, because they can go back and call those, those uh, laws unconstitutional. You know, Judge Shepard, the officer that I referred to, when we asked him uh, why would he shoot and what did he think about it, he said, police officers ought not act like criminals. A drug dealer's worst fear is being robbed by another drug dealer. And when an officer executes a no-knock warrant, he's really put himself into acting like a criminal. So my question is, why would a judge issue a no-knock warrant in the first place? Well, it depends on the circumstances. And so uh, for our criminal, and usually, obviously, we see that with our criminal court judges and everything is done on a case-by-case basis. But when that police officer comes in and presents the affidavit and states certain facts in that affidavit, then the, then the judge is normally just operating based on information that's been provided by the law enforcement officer through the affidavit. And so if it presents itself where it might be safer uh, for the law enforcement officers to go in with the no-knock, also the concept of preserving evidence. Sometimes uh, if people know that the police are at the door, they are going to uh, try to destroy potential evidence that you know will be essential in prosecuting that person. So, you know, but it, it, you have to do a cost benefit analysis. So that means that, you know, do you want to put these officers at risk for, um, a, you know, arresting somebody on possession of a controlled dangerous substance. And so when you look at the bigger picture, realistically, if somebody is in possession of, you know, uh, a, a key of cocaine, uh, a kilo of cocaine, or, you know, 100 pounds of marijuana, the sentence is still not going to be death for that if they are actually prosecuted. So I think that doing the cost benefit analysis and saying, is it safe for the law enforcement officers? Is it safe for the community? Because you have neighbors that could be adversely affected by law enforcement going in with this no not warrant. But based on the information that's presented to the judge and they're looking at those factors, they'll make a determination if they believe that that's the safest way for the law enforcement officer to actually operate is utilizing this no not warrant. But just, just paying attention to it. And then sometimes uh, common sense just, and I understand that everybody doesn't have it, but just using common sense to say, you know, is this, the, is this going to be the best, safest way for, um, for uh, people to proceed? I had, I had a case on, from a civil side that um, could have potentially placed uh, sheriff deputies um, in, in an in a uncomfortable, maybe not safe spot. I looked at the information. I paid attention to the facts that was presented before myself. And I made the decision that I felt was safe for all parties involved. And so we need people to be able to, to think and come and have some, some sense with their decisions and then also follow the law, but looking at the totality of the circumstances and not just looking at um, a narrow set of facts. You know, I, I don't want to pick on you, Judge, but <laughs> I, I can't help but notice if we're talking about qualified immunity or no knock warrants, we're really talking about the sensibilities of judges. Well, I think that I, I can't, I can't say that because that wouldn't be the nicest thing to say. But what I can tell you is, is that I think that you know having people in place that will make the right decisions is critical. And exactly. so, but part of that is, is that paying attention to who you're electing, paying attention to what they've done in the past. So one of the things that I think was very crucial to me is that uh, I prayed a lot, a whole lot, and, and I served God all the time. But then also people were able to see the work that I've done in the community. So I just didn't decide and, and you know, woke up in 2017 and say, hey, I want to work for judge. I worked in the community. I, I was in the trenches with the people trying to make sure that we provided access to, to health care and to education and quality housing. And then 
you know, criminal justice and access to just understanding what happens in court. And so we need citizens who will understand what people's platforms are, but then also what they've done. So when people are running for political office, they might have television commercials and billboards and, you know, 30 second sound bites and slogans that say, oh, I'm the best person for you, but that's not good enough. Like you have to really go back and look at what they're doing. And even when we talk about from the presidential component, you had 234 judges that were uh, appointed at that federal level. That matters because some of those people will make different kinds of decisions that, you know, Attorney Hershey, you may not agree with and uh, a number of people may not uh, agree with, but when you look at it, um, it's, it's problematic. But part of it is we, the community, we have to take the, the responsibility. When I talk to uh, the, attorney, the, the judges, rather, Judge uh, Sims, uh, about you, Attorney Hersey Jones, and we should talk about all the work that you've done. So, and, and you look at the foundations that you've laid, it matters because people know it. But if, if we have people that are, are just being elected or appointed who have not served the masses and been out there with the community, then it's problematic because if you never, if you never walked in some of the, um, the, the roads that some of these people are doing, like walking with them, not necessarily personally experiencing, but at least walking with them and having communication and understanding, I don't think that you can be as effective because you have no idea what their struggles are and, and what's going on in those areas. And I think it's just problematic across the board. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Dennis, Brianna Taylor involved a no not warrant. And we know what happened with her in her case. But what people don't may not remember is her boyfriend who shot at the police uh, was initially charged. And recently in Shreveport, I was contacted by a gentleman whose brother is serving a life sentence because the police, they didn't execute a no not warrant, but they executed as if it was, they did a dynamic entry. And he said he didn't know they were police. They kicked in and a police officer got killed uh, back in, uh, I wanna say back in the nineties. But he's serving a life sentence. And one of the problems with these no-knock warrants is that it's a problem for the police, but it also is a problem on the other side. And the person is held accountable for killing the police. What do we do about that? Well, <clears throat> that's where we talk about uh, it, what we said earlier. And Chauvin uh, would not have found, been found guilty had not been for that film, had not been on camera. And so what you have there, you got the policeman's word or whatever circumstances, evidence a lot of times against a black person. When you have that type of a situation is the, the story goes usually in a way to support uh, what the white people say or the police officers say. So to do that type of protection, there isn't much more you can do about that except the fact is of preparing the public for such incidences, what you do and not do. And in terms of what laws that exist there is, but also who is going to be the judges in those particular community to make certain decisions that's going to impact the outcome of, uh, in such a situation. Because if, if when, when that happens, the, the Brianna case, I mean, you, I mean, he had uh, that case there. You have all types circumstances with him. I mean, he uh, she was dating another guy, probably, you know, and then you got somebody knocking on the door. And you're there. You got all kinds of things going through your head. Is I mean, but to shoot a, when a police officer does, he does put himself out there. Is but it's who where the law is in favor of. Laws are made to protect the people in, in power, right? And they usually pe pe put people in place in order to be able to execute those laws to protect those in power. So what's beginning to shift is, is the fact is, is that when you, got, when you start talking about the protection like uh, 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 body cameras and other, whereby the public can see, you know, uh, and, and take it out from the fact is that their word against your word or whatever you have is, that's gonna make a whole lot of differences. But we also have to figure out, educate the communities what we can do about this. I was talking about earlier. Uh, earlier. Uh, and who do you put in those places? Otherwise is, I mean, you, uh, you have to keep in mind the fact is what the laws are there for. I mean, if you look at the laws, I mean, uh, I think that what Judge said a few minutes ago is she was saying that uh, 
uh, that there's a lot of laws on the books that discriminate against black people. And they're still on the laws is we're not doing a doggone thing about getting them removed. And they come into her courtroom and other courtrooms and they're just there and they're used against black people. So, and, and, and Mr. Guzman, to be honest with you, is the no knock uh, 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 warrants was created, you know, in order to deal with black people primarily. It had a lot to do with the, with the uh, new laws in terms of what the Reagan administration and others is on the drugs piece is and arresting black, that's why you have such a large number of black males in the prison population now is. So this is a big C, it's been used against us is to do our community, one out of every five, you know, in some cases three, of black males in this country will experience some time in jail. White people is something like one out of, one out of well, 17 or one out of 20, okay? So this is where the laws are being used and have been used. It's not just no knock, it's, it's a, a stop and frisk, uh, the whole thing about profiling, you know? Uh, if you stop is, is that I had a case once in Lafayette, Louisiana, and they made, I, I subpoenaed all the documents it has and what the equipment that a police officer took care of in his car, all right? And they slipped up. They gave me the wrong list. It, it added to that list was a, 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 a an unidentifiable pistol, a weapon, a knife, a bag of weed or, or some type of drugs. So that when you stop it, so a black man driving by himself, and being pulled over by a police officer, I mean, have mercy. Because the fact is, it's his word to say what you were doing, how you were doing it is, you know, and what happened after that is. And a lot of whole, our people ended up in jail. And so it was also used after 1965 for the Voting Rights Act is to disseminate, to, to, to deal with the, 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 the power of, of, the, of the voting power of Black people. So black males are being arrested in mass across this country, especially in the South. And at the same time as when they're taken to jail, they've made an offer, you know? You ought to plead guilty or the fact that, and you can go home, all right? And so are you gonna go to trial or jail? Man ain't got no money, what do you have is, you mean I can go home? Yes, he gets a suspended sentence. All they wanted was, was to get it on his record, you know, that he had drugs. So he can get a felony, he, he can't vote anymore. So that's been used against us all the way through is, I mean, the whole, uh, 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 what's the uh, slave about the other name when you talk about the, the uh, lottery laws and stuff they have to re-enslave black people after uh, uh, the reconstruction, that whole period of time. And was not resolved until World War II when they said they needed more blacks in the army, all right? So, so then they changed the laws is so that uh, to deal with black people because he said that was not going to happen anymore. So we have to look at this piece is about what's out there and how to organize against it is because you're right, that right now is that we're in a situation is whereby or we get the uh, uh, George uh, Floyd's uh, uh, act, all right, can be turned over, turned around, or just, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a few uh, months, a few years, right, through the court system and the Supreme Court, the federal court, that's been stacked. All right, so how you deal with that is you have to figure out how to do on a local basis, how the, the, the elections, we have a lot to do because we, this is not out of, uh, this is uh, short lived, short term. And the George uh, Floyd, as I hate to say that is, but I have, I'm rolling up my sleeves <laughs> because where we are now is back to the streets where we have to do to make the kind of changes, both political and social. Mr. Dennis, I want to know that out of the uh, six congressmen from Louisiana, um, only one voted in favor of the act. And that was a uh, uh, gentleman from New Orleans. Uh, all five Republicans in Louisiana voted against it. And I also note that in the uh, 40s and the 50s, there was never a Senate bill against lynching. That's correct. And so that's that's just to point out that that's a tough deal. Uh, Attorney Hewitt, one a big question for you. This act addresses racial profiling and training. Tell us about it, and does it go far enough? Well, look, it's it's, it's a start. I mean, I, th I know that there's some who would say that it's it's, it's mostly uh, s symbolic, and that training only does 
so much, but we need some, we need a starting place on federal legislation on this point. Uh, I, I do think that there's every, almost everything in the Justice and Policing Act has to be buttressed by local efforts as well. You know, we have about 18,000 law enforcement agencies in this country when you count local, state and federal, and there's no easy button to push. There's frankly no federal legislation that would ever go far enough to guarantee compliance uh, in all 18,000 uh, law enforcement agencies. But I do think the provision on racial profiling and the other provisions that we discussed as well are at least important starting places. Because again, if we're gonna change culture, we're not gonna do it through just one provision. It's gonna be a constellation of effort that requires the, sets the fire, lights the fire, so to speak, that allows us to leverage political will, that allows us to leverage local leadership from activists to people in law enforcement like Sheriff Gusman uh, to create the change. So no, it's not perfect, but, but I think it's an important starting place. But to get it done, we need some Republican support. How do we get that? Well, you and, need Republican and, support and or filibuster reform. Uh, so there's, there, there's a couple- change. Tell us about it. What's that? We're gonna need some radical change, you're right. Which one- That's right, you, you, need, you need some type of change. I mean, I think that goes for voting. Look, I just say one thing to the points that were raised about voting that other ways before. I'm glad to hear it at the Lawyers Committee. We do a huge amount of work on voting and we coordinate the National Election Protection Effort, the voting hotline, a 66 our vote, which you can use for voter information, including in the congressional uh, run, uh, election that's happening right now, the runoff uh, in, 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 I guess, uh, District 2 uh, in New Orleans uh, with the runoff there. But a 66 our vote is a hotline again. But what I'm seeing around the country uh, is the openings, the beginnings of what I hope is a new moral clarity. A moral clarity that what we're seeing in, in voting, uh, what we're seeing uh, the restrictions, what we're seeing in police over step, stepping and abuses just isn't right, just isn't right. And, and I do think that we need a radical change, but that radical change starts with the shifts that we've seen in public discourse in the last several years. Who would have thought that everyone from mainstream media to even people like Pat Robertson, the arch conservative, will be speaking now saying, what is it that police are doing? What's going on? Something has to change. And so I think we have to leverage that opening and fight at every level. We cannot allow our gaze to rest on federal legislation. We cannot allow our activism and our energy to rise and fall with whether that legislation passes. We have to push on multiple fronts. So I, I really think the Dillard University Center for Racial Justice for convening this session uh, because to have the local conversations in a national context is so important. Uh, Sheriff Gusman, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Hewitt. We need your help. We need law enforcement. We need Republicans to get on board. How do we do that? I think you start with organizations like the National Sheriff's Association the International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, the local uh, state uh, sheriff's associations, the local chief of, a, of police associations. And we start educating them that uh, ultimately this is good for everybody uh, and uh, bring that message to them. Look, there are gonna be some people who are uh, convinced that the only way uh, is to have immunity, to have a qualified immunity, and they think they're going to lean on that. But ultimately, most people don't want to be associated with bad cops. Most people don't want to be dis associated with dishonest law enforcement or law enforcement. Ultimately, most people want to be on the right side, and that's what we have to appeal to. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. We've got a, a time bomb. Judge uh, Shepard, years ago when I started doing police cases, I was a tax lawyer. And someone asked me, why would I switch? And let me share with you, the panel and the audience, what I said there, and then you tell me whether I right or wrong. So we've got a time bomb ticket. The Second Amendment gives the citizens not only the right to bear arms, but the right to have a militia. And the purpose of that Second Amendment is not to protect you from criminals. It's to protect you from an out-of-control government. 
So here we are in our country with the right to bear arms, to protect yourself and the police and law enforcement that's been a little overly aggressive. Is, 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 that, is that bomb gonna go off? Uh, you ask me that? I think it's inevitable. But the problem happens to be is for us as a people, black people, is we don't have the weapons. Uh, I don't know if people remember uh, back in the 60s, uh, that 60s, the N National Rifle Association them is they went out and they were getting uh, uh, weapons in mass from the army who was putting these auctions up of used weapons. So they were auctioning off like armored tanks and ground air missiles and all that stuff like that. They don't even know what happened. Who bought them? They claimed. They just sort of disappeared, you know, but they were out, they got them and they, everybody didn't know they bought them. But what happened to them, nobody knows. So then also now in terms of being, a, that's this group of uh, people we talk about now are very well armed. So it's not like uh, we had some equal, I guess, the basis of trying to do something work, work to some extent. In Louisiana, you had the Deacons for Defense, you had other groups of that nature who sort of helped to give protect civil rights workers and other people, you know, at, at, at the homes where we have, especially in Shreveport, in fact, it was started right there in Jonesboro. But the day is where we are is, is that uh, uh, it's, it's inevitable, but we on the losing end. So how do you deal with that is if we don't begin to talk about how to organize to, uh, 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 to, uh, for this and uh, to protect ourselves in some type of way, I think we're in trouble is because what happened on November the 6th was just a prelude to what can happen. I mean, that was a very frightening thing. You got people walking around with ARs, you know, I mean, on, strapped on their shoulders and stuff like this is, you know, and you got a, a state like uh, South Carolina, where I am now is, you know, you can wear you can wear your guns like in the cowboy days. You know? And so, this situation is very serious and dangerous. I mean, uh, I mean, you, you got to shoot up almost every day. Uh, you know. So when it comes to the question you're raising here, is it's inevitable, uh, but these people are so brave they're able to walk around down Main Street in the capital of the country with guns on and nobody do anything about it. They can storm the Capitol and nothing's being done about it. So they arrest 40 some people, so what, you know? So this situation is a very, very serious one that we may have to begin to think about and try to deal with. How, I'm not sure, but we better start talking about it. We better start talking about it our people. We better start talking about it in the churches. We better start talking about it in the courtrooms. We better start talk about it in the schools. Because this is real. It's not something that we look at a movie, you know. So yeah. it's there, you know. We're here. Just Shepherd. You know, I think it is very problematic. It is, but there's also been some argument stating that when the Second Amendment was written, it was written for that particular time. And so some people have uh, suggested that we need to address that the time that it was written um, and the reason why it was written, then it may not be as, um, I guess, timely for us in 2021. So we need to have, you know, maybe a, a modification. However, I, I just kind of want to kind of remind people that there's also arguments that's been made that uh, unfortunately people of color um, will not have the same enjoyment claiming Second Amendment rights um, as other people. And, and we've seen that um, sometimes on video and just throughout the country with different people uh, being, you know, killed, but then also people being arrested. And so I, I think that it is problematic. And I think that it's uh, dangerous and it's scary. And, uh, and I think that we do have to uh, address it. I like to just kind of chime in on one component of the um, of the act before we kind of lose uh, all the minutes because I know we're almost out of time. But the act also points out that police could be charged if they act recklessly. So I think that we need to kind of uh, maybe have some conversation about what acting recklessly is so that way we can have uh, better details. I think that um, the states are going to ultimately have to decide um, based on whatever the federal legislation is that's ultimately passed, if it is indeed passed, or what is that going to look like? Are we going to just use um, the basic um, negligence standard looking at the do the risk analysis, or are we going to 
create like a heightened standard um, for those particular is issues as far as uh, that conduct. The other thing of it is, is that are we, I mean, the states are, are we going to look for the states to create maybe something simple, similar to like a um, what we do in our medical malpractice cases where we have a fund that's going to be set up to actually compensate people for it. Uh, is there going to be any conversations about also having um, people who violate um, maybe being personally responsible versus just having the states and the cities responsible? Uh, the other thing that uh, we have to also uh, keep in mind too is that when we talk about um, the, the consequences and, and holding people accountable. So I think that, that we have to kind of look at all of those things and say that what are we going to do to make sure that the legislation is going to be effective if it is passed uh, to impact all states. The other thing that I think we have to also maybe hopefully somebody would consider is that when there was conversation about reducing uh, the alcohol level uh, from um, 0.1 to 0.08, well, some states, including Louisiana, who was reluctant to do that, well, it was attached to dollars. And so when you attach it to money, I think we may see some changes because when we talked about the infrastructure and streets, highways, and bridges, well, money was going to be withheld if we didn't change from 0.1 to 0.08. And so I think that if we see some of that same kind of movement with this act, if it is indeed passed, uh, then I think we might make some progress. And again, just steps to going forward. Uh, you asked earlier about how do we uh, try to get, you know, kind of get it moving? Well, obviously we're going to need bipartisan support uh, if it does. And then Senator uh, Tim Scott, because at the end of the day, if he stopped in an area um, that nobody knows who he is, at the end of the day, they're going to identify him as being a black male first. And because we've seen people of color adversely affected um, by these incidents that's that's reoccurring, then hopefully um, what his um, position, he'll be able to help um, and get some of his colleagues to understand that we have several people that are affected by this and we need to change um, some of these laws and pass things that will hold all people accountable for the benefit of the country. Thank you. Just yes, 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 you. Oh, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. I said years ago, I heard a black FBI agent that if all the officer has to say is, I feared for my life, then we're all dead. Well, and, and that's, that's what we've seen. And, and, and that's what we've seen. Now, in terms of, Scott, we're going to turn to our good friend, Mr. Uh, Dennis. Uh, you're from South Carolina. Are you in South Carolina? Now? I'm in South Carolina. I, I, uh, I'm, really, I'm from Louisiana. I spent 25 years of my life in New Orleans. So, and the others in Shreveport. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Scott is inside. laughs> so uh, I'm here as a, I was partial of a retirement thing. Is a, 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 a living out here. So, it's a nice, uh, nice spot to be in. I'm about uh, 30 to 45 minutes from five different beaches, so it's something to you know to go out and relax in. But my heart is in Louisiana. So uh, prior to the pandemic, I was in New Orleans, you know, every month, uh, uh, four to six weeks, uh, primarily at Dillard University. But I'm is can we count on you to reach out to Mr. Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott? Sure, Tim Scott is an interesting person, but he is he's he's a, he's a he's party man. And I, Tim Scott, uh, Scott tells the story about his being pulled over several times in South Carolina by police on the same uh, situation that uh, 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 Judge uh, Shepard uh, mentioned here is, and because he was black and he was treated like a black man, and. Um, and so that's the problem. I mean, you know, what I'm try to change. I think that he, if there's any way to reach him. Uh, they would talk. I mean, he would talk about it, but he is uh, he is a uh, very interesting person. As well, I said, I don't think I can talk to him. <laughs> He's not going to talk to me. <laughs> but I think that you right. Just I want to just make one comment here. The second, I mean, the Second Amendment, when it was written, is right at a different time. They were using muskets, so by the time you do, you know, do a shot out and do it like this, everybody could run them hard. They didn't have any idea the kind of weapons you have now. You know. But it makes no difference. It's who interprets the Constitution, all right? And that falls in the hands of the judges, right? And, 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 and ultimately to the Supreme Court. And that's where we are with this piece is who interprets the law? I mean, uh, 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 here and what's going on. It's, it's, so that's why people are feeling very, you know, uh, you know, free to do what they're doing is and hold this whole thing about the Constitution, hold and use the Constitution as a shield because the Constitution was actually written 
all right, uh, about the, to protect the people in power. Uh, if we talk about, if we really look at the constitution, one piece of the constitution that makes sense to everybody is the preamble to the constitution. If we can figure out how to make that real, uh, you know, which really describes what the uh, uh, union is supposed to be about, the United States and whatever they have, is Im embedded into that preamble of the constitution. But yeah, in terms of what we do uh, uh, about this is, I think is we just have to really sell it down and begin to argue because what's being used, the constitution is being used not for us, but it's being used against us. I mean, that's, that's what's scary about it. I mean, when you say, what do we do about this? Is, you know, the constitution, the way it's being interpreted is ter being interpreted in a way like what's going on in, in Georgia and other places, in Florida, in terms of border rights, it goes to the states to making these decisions, you know? Dennis, I wanna, before I go to our, my next question, uh, let, me, let me say, what we have to recognize is the constitution did not give blacks the right to vote. That's correct. And that really hadn't changed. Uh, there's still a thought in this country that don't believe blacks should have the right to vote. And if we exercise the right to vote, it should be thrown out. Uh, but we, we got four minutes left. Uh, Sheriff Gusman, any comments you'd like to make before we open up for questions? No, I, I think the only thing I would add is that we have to fight on a bunch of fronts. You know, we can't just fight on the front of uh, qualified immunity in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. We have to fight education uh, equality. We have to fight for voting equality. Uh, we have to keep fighting. And, and you know, the eternal vigilance is, is what we have to have. And we can't relax and say, oh, it's okay. We made a good accomplishment. We can't let down. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ashmel, do you have any, I think we have time for one or two or three questions. Do you have any there for us? Yeah, we have one question and this is based off a comment uh, that Mr. Dennis mentioned earlier. Uh, this uh, attendee indicates, I appreciate the connection to the black power movement in particular on the political movement of the late 1960s. What connection do you see today with voting rights, police reform and the demonization of the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm personally, I see that as a, as a quite a similarity between the Black Lives Matter movement and the young people in the 60s. The movement was made up of a lot of people, a lot of different people is across the board for, uh, 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 in, in the 60s. But primarily was pushing that leading, leading this is and pushing it and doing the kind of things is that made it uh, help to make a difference were young people. You know, in their, in their late uh, eight, uh, teens and their early 20s. Uh, when I left Dillard University, I was 20 years old, on a, well, going on a freedom ride. 21, I was making a decision whether or not people live or die. I was made a decision by Cheney Goodman Swerner, they died in, the, in uh, Neshoba County. I was with Megan Edwards one hour before he was assassinated. So at, at that time, I was 22. So. The Black Lives Matter movement is what's going on in the surge that you have of young people going into the streets because the fact is, they're seeing the fact is, is that they, you, their voices need to be heard and somebody to say something and you have to do something. As John Lewis says, you know, talked about the fact is good trouble, you know, and that's what this is all about. It's going to have to make a difference when we get the people together. So I see a relationship, correlation between the two groups. And I think that young people is, and we have to be able to work with the young people and give them the kind of support that we got in the 60s. Uh, well, we old people like myself is need to give them support and uh, 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 today. So that's why I see there is that approach. I think the answer is in their hands, you know, but they need our support system. And I see a strong relationship between the two because we wouldn't have you know, black judges, black lawyers, the extent that we have now is, or the fact is of, of businesses that we have is, and people in certain positions in this country, black is, had not been for those young people in the day back then. And as things begin to move forward and make the change we need is and make this the, uh, the uh, George Floyd's act real, it's gonna depend upon what these young people are able to do. They have support and put into place something that's gonna protect it and, and support it. 
Can you talk a little bit, Mr. Dennis, about our summer institute that we are planning and the Freedom Ride that we plan on doing? Can you talk about that a little bit before we close out? Uh, yeah, well, that's uh, they uh, briefly, but uh, so really, uh, young people across, we do a lot of work with HBCUs, all right, Historic Black College University around the country. And so they are now beginning at Dillard University, as in Xavier University, we've been working with for several years. And uh, what they're beginning to do is organize, they'll have a big summit this summer is, whereby they're addressing the issue around uh, social justice in this country. And so they're inviting in people to participate, which you get the notices on. And they have participants from across the country from HBCUs to really begin to address this issue on a broader basis. And they've been having these discussions like this at HBCUs across the country throughout this year, since the pandemic is going on. They show films and they have discussions around the films is, on the basis is, and uh, that's really important. Then they came up uh, uh, a few uh, weeks ago with an idea of having like a freedom ride for justice beginning in uh, New Orleans. And they would take a buses uh, beginning next year, take a bus load of people from New Orleans and go up to Washington DC making certain demands around education, border suppression and social justice. But on their way there, they'd be stopping on HBCU campuses at uh, uh, the rallies and, and, uh, and also uh, the state capitals or wherever you have is until they get to Washington DC. By the time they get to Washington DC, they hope to have buses of, of black kids and people from all over the country to join them there and be part of that particular uh, freedom ride. And there they make certain demands on Congress about the needs of being support and changing laws and making laws is that's gonna address those particular issues. All that has not been drawn out, be doing it. So anybody wants to, uh, uh, get in contact with these people. Uh, it's all this one person we deal with and Joe Gibbons, who's on here, are uh, people who really play an important role in supporting the young people. So they have a, an adult advisory group to work with the young people, but it's being led by, uh, by the young people. And we as adults are just giving them support and trying to put a floor beneath them to support them. What I think is a beautiful thing is young black people making a demand of this country is for the changes they think is necessary so that there can be freedom for all, once and for all. Is that what thank you, you said? Yes, yeah. thank you, Mr. Dennis. And we'll be sharing more information about that throughout the summer as we plan for this in late August on Dillard University's um, campus. Um, we're over time. Does you all have any final comments or thoughts before we end our webinar? I simply mm -hmm. want to thank the panel for the discussions and make one note that it appears this is our 1776. We get a chance to remake and reform America. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Damon had to leave a little bit early because he had to get to another meeting. Um, so we want to thank him as well. Um, and thank all of you. This was very thought provoking, a very great learning experience, not only for myself, I'm sure everybody who has, has attended. And all of you are on our executive board for the Center for Racial Justice. So we look forward to continuing to work to address these issues as we move forward. And once again, I want to thank you all for uh, being on our webinar today.